In part one, we laid a lot of groundwork for our understanding of the ideas that drive Berserk forward. The symbolism of swords, the competing aspects of masculinity and femininity, and how being on only one side of that spectrum can be a very damaging thing. With those ideas, Mira built up an incredible baseline of emotional experience. We, like the characters, experience events in fiction just like we do in real life and those experiences color how we engage with the story that comes afterward. Your understanding, the emotions you feel as you read Berserk after the Eclipse, would not be nearly as powerful, nearly as momentous, as they are without that groundwork. But the Golden Age is not the start of Berserk. There was an additional baseline prototype that many people skip for various reasons. The first time we see the character named Guts, is in a story called The Black Swordsman. In this sort of flash-forward epilogue to the Golden Age, wherein Guts approaches a town with an apostle as its king, Guts' brand starts to bleed, and it is readily apparent that we are past the Eclipse. In fact, near the end of the chapter, Guts meets Griffith, this time as Femto, and tries to kill him for what he's done. At this point, the reader is unaware of the Eclipse, so Femto seems far off and strange, but regardless, the attack does not work, and he is instead forced back into the world and attacked by the demons of the God Hand. He survives, but during the fight, he destroys the entire castle while fighting the Apostle. But there's one thing different about this. The Apostle in this story has a young daughter, a girl named Teresia, and at the end of this epilogue, Guts... Puck and her are the only ones left alive in the ruins of the castle. After Guts saves her life, she, horrified by the murder of her father and the destruction of her home, says this. Guts, in this section of Berserk, is a brooding man. The entire chapter he has been callous, cold, and ruthless, even horrifying Puck at the things he would say and the disregard he has for the ones around him. Even then, Gut seems indignant, but as he walks away from the traumatized girl, Mira drew us this panel. In psychology, there is a thing called cognitive dissonance. It's a mental state wherein we are presented with a fact or circumstance that contradicts our previous conception of the world. In this scene, you can see what Miura was going for. Guts, who has been one of the most heartless people up to this point, is crying. The burdens of the horrors that torment him during the night do have an effect on him, and when the dust settles and the night is over, the tears well up and fall at last. With this scene, Miura tried to force us to reevaluate how we looked at Guts. He wanted to shift our perspective with one panel. The tough guy act is a facade. The terrors and abuses Guts faces do build up, and they grow and grow until they materialize into droplets of water in his eyes, like the dew of cold mornings. The chapter would then blossom with complexity. You see, a common marker of psychological health is how a person resolves abrupt cognitive dissonance. If they retreat into themselves, maybe lie about what they originally thought or simply disagree in the face of the facts, then their mental state is generally regarded as unhealthy. On the other hand, if they accept that their previous conception of the world was wrong, then improvement is possible and a positive development can occur. This being said, it doesn't quite work here, does it? The artwork is not that great compared to later chapters. Guts' act is also almost unbelievable at some points, and his character is a lot less interestingly written than his non-prototype counterpart. The prototype did a lot of things in a new way, and it explored the concepts of dark fantasy while also exploring something the genre doesn't usually portray well. Still, it's clear that Miro was eager to try again, and this time, he would get it right. 
After the eclipse, Miura's story explodes in breadth and scope, dragging in fantasy elements from all over the globe. The Midland army is very similar to depictions of the Knights of the Round Table. The Clifot incident is pulled directly from Jewish mysticism, and the happenings around Enoch Village are clearly inspired by Germanic fairy tales. Altogether, it makes for a marvelous combination, and from here, we are given a new part of the story. The Conviction arc ends with Guts finally finding Casca again at the Cathedral of St. Albion, an immense, gothic structure of untold torture and pain. The church at St. Albion has committed atrocities over its long existence, and it rests on a pile of ever-growing corpses. News of the Black Swordsman has spread, and the Army of the Holy See sends out a task force to hunt him down. Last time, we evaluated characters on a specific spectrum, whether they are more phallic or yonic, masculine or feminine, and how that drives Berserk forward. Griffith is unreachably phallic, and his conviction for dominance over others defines his actions throughout the story. Guts was also an incredibly phallic character, yet he is pulled back to a much more healthy center by the love Casca showed for him. Being unhealthily dominant, however, is not the only unhealthy end of that spectrum. And at this point in the story, we see what the other extreme looks like. Lady Farnesa also had a tragic childhood. Her starkly religious parents were also neglectful of her, leading her to become needful of a sense of belonging. This manifests as a desire to be controlled by something, to be part of something greater than herself, and in true yonic form, she becomes dominated by the religion of the Holy See. She took part in the burning of heretics at a young age, and she is so open to being controlled that she starts to accept the atrocities she commits as acts of faith and fulfillment. Mira depicts the negative aspects of Yonic extremism with symbols like flagellation, religious submission, and of course, penetration. This is why, in a delirious state after being attacked by the demon's hunting guts, she asks him to cut her in two. She needs to be penetrated, to be dominated, or at least she feels like she needs that. And when her veneer of reason leaves her, her desire manifests as vivid depictions of self-destructive mental turmoil. But, Guts doesn't do it. The Black Swordsman, the man with the impossibly large sword, denies her request of domination. All of her life, she has been easily taken advantage of. Powers much bigger than her have readily and giddily taken hold of her life, and used her as a tool for their vile intentions. Guts, especially at the moment of her mental break, is the most powerful thing in her life. Stronger than her holy chain knights, stronger than the demons that surround them, stronger than her faith. And his refusal to perform the phallic act of penetration is so unusual to her that she is forced into a state of cognitive dissonance, a state that will eventually lead her into joining Guts on his journey and eventually becoming a caretaker for Casca, one she trusts quite a lot. And just like that, she is pulled by the now more level-headed Guts out of her yonic extremism and into a much more centered protector role. The Cathedral of St. Albion is home to innumerable horrors, and the agony of the souls that have died there are the perfect breeding ground for an event that only happens once every 1,000 years, the birthing ceremony. The God Hand are not corporeal things, and while they have influence over the real world, this influence is limited. This is shown in the Clipot chapter, as Slan is unable to completely control guts. That is, until the birthing ceremony. Once in a millennium, there comes an event that allows one of the God Hand to be born anew into the world of the living. The physical event itself mimics the eclipse, but it also does so psychologically. At the end of the eclipse, Casca gave birth to a cursed child. It is actually the child of her and Guts, but has been polluted and cursed by Casca's rape. The child appears and disappears throughout the story, usually only appearing at night, just like the other demons hunting for the brand, and it both haunts Guts 
and entices the now shattered Casca. At St. Albion, it horrifyingly becomes a part of the birthing ritual, giving Femto a new body to inhabit, and right before our very eyes, Griffith returns. The reason the birthing ceremony mimics the eclipse is because unconsciously, psychologically, our traumas repeat in our head. The physical scars combine with mental ones, and the things, the people that haunt us still, become born anew in a way, just like Femto was born again in front of Guts and Casca. This rebirth, however, is in many ways more terrible than the original, because it can hurt us again and again. The trauma, the malicious agents, are now in our minds, and unconsciously, loops of rumination are created. Just like how Griffith can now touch and feel the people of Midland, our past anxieties can touch us again as well. It is a terrifying thing, isn't it? Trust me, I know. Thankfully for us, though, so did Miura. Farnesa is not the only new character after the Conviction arc. In fact, Berserk's roster of characters quickly explodes, but it explodes in an interesting way. With children. Isidro is the first child Guts picks up, and he is impressed with Guts' power. Wanting to be like him, he follows Guts against his will and asks for training. Isidro's path is meant to mirror, and more importantly, diverge from Guts' own. Just like Guts was in his childhood, Isidro is young and alone. He has no one until Guts finds him, and he sees a lot of power in his image, just like Guts did with Gambino. Isidro wants to become a man above men, someone who can wield a huge sword. But here, his path changes. Unlike Guts, who was forced into manhood by Gambino, Isidro is refused his incongruous choice of weapon, and all of a sudden, the narrative purpose is clear. Despite wanting a man's sword, despite wanting to grow up too soon, he receives a small cutlass instead. A short sword, fitting for a child his size. With this, he can express himself as a boy, as a character divorced from growing up before he is ready. At this point, Serpico has also joined the party, and our spectrum of characters quickly develops into a matrix. Serpico is reserved, but devoted. Despite being incredibly skilled and able, he cannot adequately communicate with Farnesa or Guts. He doesn't have the ability to be open and honest with people, quite the opposite of Isidro, and what's more, he feels incredibly indebted to Farnesa for saving him from his impoverished childhood, which leads him to become unquestioningly loyal, even if it means following orders from her he finds horrid or immoral. This blind obedience colors how he acts towards Guts when they meet, and further separates him from others despite his kind nature. And with the addition of this axis, it becomes clear just how well written these characters are, something we will talk about more in a little bit. But first, the armor. After solely talking about symbolism of swords in the last essay, it might be surprising to realize that a second symbol has also developed alongside us from the beginning. From its inception, Berserk has had an intricate array of armors. Here, during the first major fight, we see Mira's use of this symbol in full. In the beginning, armor is used to separate enemies from our cast. We see them there, clanking in steel from head to toe, their faces masked by lumps of unfashioned metal and smooth fixtures. From our vantage point, they are no longer people in the same sense Guts is. They cease to be characters and are instead simply enemies. This perspective smoothly links with Guts' view of war and armor in general, and thus manifests during the Millennium Falcon arc as a kind of pervasive philosophy. Here, right before the Eclipse, when Guts is taking care of a crippled and silent Griffith, still unaware of his coming betrayal, he says this. Remembering this, we can carry that idea, that armor, that a separation is necessary to survive, forward to where we left off with the story. Serpico, Farnesa, Guts, Isidro, and Casca are wandering through a forest after the birthing ceremony. They are accosted by a group of trolls, which are attacking a small village. 
an elder of the village, a man called Morgan, informs them that he remembers that a witch lives in the woods and that she might be able to help them. Hurriedly, he asks for their assistance in finding her. This part of the story is very German, very Grimm's fairy tales, and as it turns out, a witch does live in the woods. Actually, two witches do, an elder and her protege. And this is where we meet another child, Shirka. Shirka is an incredibly important character in Berserk. Not only does she represent the innocence and complex potentiality that the story associates with children, but she is powerful. Flora, her teacher, soon dies as a result of Griffith's attack on her home, one of the first atrocities he commits after his return to the physical world. But Shirka survives, and becomes an omnipresent figure in the group. With her companionship, the other main characters also get items that represent either the characteristics that they have, or the ones that they lack. Isidro gets another dagger, this one imbued with the spirits of fire, befitting his flagrant personality and young age. Farnesa gains a mentor and a friend, and soon learns that she is very good at magic if she commits herself to it. This gift she uses to be a better caretaker for Casca and Guts. Serpico gains a cloak and sword blessed by the wind, freeing him a little and pointing him into a more liberated role, alluding to his troubles with communication and personal reservation. And Guts. Guts receives the armor. And here, Mira flips the symbols on us. Armor in literature, just like swords, has a rich and fascinating history. Its start is almost unknowable, as war and battle have been around since before literature existed, but a good starting point is all the way back in 700 BC, with the Iliad. Homer, like many of his early contemporaries, was in the business of impressing people, and to do this he used poetry and mythology to great effect. In the Iliad, armor represents two distinct things. Dehumanization and legacy. The first meaning, dehumanization, can actually take the form of two polar opposite ideas. First, it can, as it often does with the knights of Griffith and the Apostles, function as a way to make an enemy seem more beast than human. From the very first chapter, armor is used as a way to transform the enemy into something fearsome. We know guts can kill men, but what if these men, the leaders of these opposing forces, are cloaked in a shield of metal, their faces completely covered, their bodies entirely wrapped in forged brass or iron. Their names, of course, are no longer names of men. They are the Rhino Knights, the Knights of the Black Dog, the Knights of the Holy Iron Chain. All names of inhuman beings, symbolizing both literally and figuratively their inhuman power. No longer men, but animals, beasts of the battlefield. The concealment of flesh and face creates a terrifying depiction of power. The Berserker armor does the same thing to Guts, and his aspect is warped and degraded as well. The now famous Black Knight is another excellent example of this in literature, and is, of course, another idea Miura uses to incredible effect. The idea of the Black Knight first appears in a book we already talked about, the seminal work of Arthurian legend Le Morte Arthur by Thomas Mallory. In this story, the Black Knight refers to Sir Tristram. Now, Sir Tristram is an incredibly complex and interesting character, and exploring all of his appearances in literature is outside the scope of this video. But an important aspect in his relationship to Berserk is his role as a counterpart to Sir Lancelot. Lancelot is in love with Queen Guinevere, King Arthur's wife, and Sir Tristram is in love with Queen Isolde. Both yearn for the love of a married woman, and at their meeting, they end up fighting. Tristram in his defining black armor, and Lancelot in his shining silver. And yet, they don't end up killing each other, and actually become close friends after their fight out of respect for one another. Similar to another black and white pair, we know. Black knights have become a staple of modern fantasy, and they reappear in many famous works, including, of course, Berserk. The second part of the dehumanization of armor is the opposite of this beast-like mantle, apotheosis. Armor can also elevate someone from humanity into a kind of godhood. In shining armor, knights seem infallible, perfect, impenetrable, like King Arthur, 
And while the aspect of this is the opposite of the beasthood displayed by that color of dehumanization, the effect is the same. Now, it's important to understand here that Achilles in the Iliad is not immortal. This concept actually appears almost 700 years later in a work called The Achilliad by Statius, and Homer does not make any mention of Achilles' fabled invincibility. He is mortal, and thus needs armor to survive. He is, however, almost always depicted as being faster and stronger than his opponents, and this seems to be why he is regarded as unkillable in the Iliad. This is why Achilles' armor is such a huge part of his character in Homer's poem. He does not need it to be exceptional, but his display of armor, which has been forged by Hephaestus himself, makes him seem above the men around him. In the gleaming brass, he becomes a symbol of the prowess he already possesses. He becomes elevated and intimidating. This use of armor in the Iliad too is understood by Mira, and used accordingly. The second prominent purpose of armor in literature, also set up by the Iliad, is that of legacy. The Achaeans, which are what Homer calls the Greeks in the poem, have a deep and ceremonial relationship to armor. At many points in the story, Homer pauses his poetic descriptions of war and mythology to simply show one man passing his armor to another. This happens most prominently between Glaucus, a Trojan, and Diomedes, a Nicaean. Here, the history of the armor is what matters. The scars, dents, and victories that the armor has experienced can be literally passed down, can be given to others, and with this ritual sharing of a physical thing, a history and a power are shared too. If Achilles gives his armor to another, then he could be seen as Achilles too, and all of the victories that Achilles has achieved can be shared, imparted to the next generation of warrior. In this way, armor symbolizes a way to pass down the triumphs and struggles of our forefathers in a beautifully literate way. And this idea is something Mira might even use to greater effect, albeit a much more subtle one, than dehumanization. The Berserker armor is a powerful thing. At this point in the story, its origins are unknown, but its powers are quickly discovered by the group. At rest, the armor appears normal, but whenever Guts feels in danger, whenever the situation starts slipping out of control, a black, wolf-like hood crawls over his head, and the armor takes over. When possessed by it, Guts gains incredible strength and agility. He can, all of a sudden, jump hundreds of feet, survive falls from immense heights, and generate impossible forces with his sword. If he receives an injury, the armor will contort and force his limbs back into position, keeping him going beyond the point the trauma should allow. Now, under its power, and from our new perspective, Guts becomes the dehumanized thing. Divided both physically and emotionally, the armor acts as a wall, an impenetrable physical and mental fortress that, while definitely protecting him from his inhuman enemies, also divides him from his friends. The Berserker armor is a product of an eclipse, both literally and symbolically. Just like before, when Casca brought down the emotional walls to free him from his phallic extremity, the eclipse built up new ones. These emotional walls, these defense mechanisms, rapidly take over whenever Guts feels threatened, and, in doing so, he falls into the same trap he had before. But this time, there is no Casca to rescue him. And here, the beast reappears in all its horror. This time, it talks to Guts, beckoning him to give in, to let it take control. And sometimes, the armor wins. As the cowl clamps over Guts' head, he becomes lost in the armor, and while it allows him to perform inhuman feats of strength and resilience, it divides him completely. While possessed, he can't hear the calls or screams of his friends. He becomes a deaf, blind mechanism of rage and retaliation. No one can reach him. That is, except for Shirka. As I said before, Shirka is an incredibly important character. In the story, her training in the magical arts allows her to project herself into the astral world. Her phantasmal form can fly alongside the deaf guts and contact him within the delirium of the armor. This, symbolically, is tied to her innocence as a child, which links us cleanly back to the importance of children in our narrative. 
Symbolically, Mira is tying a kind of inherent naturalism with the power of innocence. Shirka is a child, and often gets frustrated or nervous as children do, but this is because they do not yet have these defense mechanisms that cloud them up. Without any trauma, without any emotional roadblocks, they are able to be open and communicate freely. This is something Guts has always struggled with, but his relationship to Shirka starts to pull him back. After the destruction of Flora's home, the group, now one stronger, head out into the woods and are soon accosted by the workings of the night. Flora, before she was killed by the new band of the Hawk, tells him that there is a way to heal Casca's mind. Across the sea, there is a place untouched by the evils of the world. Elfhelm, the place where many magical beings live and originate from. So, we have established that our characters exist on a wide spectrum, and that together they all gravitate towards its center. The children of the group are the closest to this goal, as they have been pulled to its extremes the least. But this begs an important question. Is there a character at the center of our matrix? Well, maybe. As they travel toward the port of Ritanis, they meet a small child for the first time. The moonlit boy, who becomes a very mysterious character during the Fantasia arc, is almost certainly a manifestation of Casca and Guts's child. He exists as a kind of counterpart to the demon child, the part of her pregnancy that Griffith corrupted, and even though he can only appear during the full moon, he still surreptitiously brings the two together again, even if only for a little while. This will repeat throughout the rest of the story, and even though the moonlit child does seem to have some connection to Griffith, still, he is undoubtedly the closest character we have to a blank slate, and his development and the development of the other children in the story that are influenced by both Griffith and Guts will likely color the outcome of the storyline. But, let's get back on track. Vritanis is being attacked by the Kashan Empire, an eastern army ruled by the distant, yet still terrifying Ganishka. And as they fight on, it becomes clear just how lost Guts can become. Still, Shirka continues to prevail over the influence of the beast. Time after time, she rips the cowl back, and with her help, Guts can think and communicate clearly. From this part on, it becomes Shirka's job to keep Guts' beast in check, to pull him back to us, to his friends. She becomes a foil to the beast that tries to suck Guts back into himself, back into his trauma, away from others, and towards the volatile power that lies in being closed off. But Shirka doesn't let it and with her help, the band successfully makes it to Vritanis. There, they eventually do find a ship, but then, the Kushan reach them. Magic systems are also vastly important to fantasy literature, and it has become a trope today that modern fantasy has become closely linked to how interesting or different their magic systems are from the norm. Mira decides, instead, to tie the magical elements of his story loosely together, with an overarching theme of oneness of spirit, but he shies away from explaining it completely. This works within his world because of the diversity of the narrative themes. If Mira were to create and explain a vast and all-encompassing magic system that took into account every culture's habits and abilities, it would soon fall out of the bounds of understanding. In fact, a huge part of Berserk's characterization is tied strongly to how there is always a character that represents the audience in each major scene. Whether it's Isidro asking Guts about how he can become like the Black Swordsman, or Isma saying, too complicated, when being told how the magical world works, there is always a character that represents us. And this shows just how well Mira knows what his audience is feeling, and when going too far will make their attention wander. Because of this understanding, the audience is always represented somewhere. And nowhere is this more important than in Falconia. Emperor Ganishka, the leader of the Kushan Empire, is an apostle of the God Hand. However, he is unique in that he believes he can surpass their power with pure might. Through the agonizing torture of countless souls, he creates his own Behelit, and seeks to rebirth himself in it. But as he begins to gain ground on the Midland army, a white light shines on the horizon. Griffith has returned, and under the new banner of the Band of the Hawk, in under an hour, he completely ruins Ganishka's army, 
previously hundreds of thousands strong. Unable to take the strain, Kanishka lowers himself into his demonic womb and is rebirthed into this. However, even this hulking behemoth of raw power is killed by Griffith too, and out of the cosmic wound that the strike leaves, pours out the astral world. This event was the God Hand's goal. With the divide that separates the astral and physical planes torn apart, the God Hand and everything else can pour freely into the realm of the living. Our fears, the spiritual manifestations of our traumas, can now freely manifest in this world. This disaster, however, is clad in a veneer of triumph. In Vertanus's place, the city of Falconia is instantly erected, a shining light at the end of the Midland coast, with Griffith as its king. Hundreds of thousands of people flock to the city of the Falcon to seek shelter from the plague of spirits and demons that now inhabit the surrounding land and they do find a solace. Griffith and his knights are strong, supernaturally so, and he offers a protection from the rift he himself opened. And along with the thousands of people, we are finally reunited with Rickert, the boy that saved Casca and Guts after the eclipse. He finds harbor in the impossibly large city, and then, after all this time, gains a council with Griffith. Something that at this point, we might want to. Rickert, in this situation, is us. He has seen almost everything we have seen up to the eclipse. He knows what Griffith did. He took care of Guts and Casca. He has met Skull Knight and has seen the horrors that the opened rift has brought into reality. And, as he approaches the betrayer, the cause of our torment, he slaps Griffith the King of Falconia, across the face. Here, literally, we have a reversal of Griffith's control. Yes, our horrors are now a reality, but if they can touch us, then we can touch them too. And humans have something that mindless demons do not. A kind of dissent, a will toward a future justice, an instinctive defiance of evil. Even if that injustice is as powerful as a god. And at this moment, Mira is showing us that he knows what we want. He knows we want Griffith to be something tangible in front of us, something we can hit, something we can strike down with power or force. But what happens next, in the final arc of the story so far, shows us that he is trying to teach us something slightly different. During the death of Ganishka, our party, who escaped on the ship after the Kushan were defeated, are already sailing to Elfhelm. They pass by miles of ocean, leagues of sea, and eventually land for a reprieve on a strange-looking island. While exploring the coast, Isidro finds one of the most incredible natural formations in the series, an enormous cave seemingly descending deep into the ocean below. He stares at it for a while, before hearing someone else on the rocks with him. And this is where we meet Isma. Isma, like Isidro and Shirka, is a child too. She also carries all of the symbolism of innocence and openness that other children do, but she also has something else. In part one, we talked about how nudity is used in Berserk to portray how emotionally available someone is. Guts' development on this track is both symbolic and literal, and Casca's love allows him to finally be physically and emotionally naked in front of her. Isma is a marrow, a mermaid-like creature born of the sea, and because of this, she has no problem being naked in front of others. Of course, like all nudity in Berserk, her openness affects the people around her, and her excitement at finally meeting new people quickly assimilates her into the group. All is not well on the island, however, and we soon learn what lurks at the bottom of the cave into the sea. Here, on this remote island at the edge of the earth, sleeps the god of the sea, a phantasmal, Lovecraftian monster, a sable and malicious spirit of the viciousness of nature. Previously, it has been locked away by the marrow and bound behind the veil of the astral plane, but with Griffith's tearing of that barrier, it is awake once more, 
Its influence transforms the inhabitants of the island into monstrous sea creatures, very similar to H.P. Lovecraft's The Shadow Over Innsmouth. And, as the group flees onto the ship, they realize that their only means of survival is to kill it once and for all. Guts and Shirka enter the cave, leaving Farnesa and her newly learned magic skills to save the ship. And what they find is a horror they have never before seen. The sea god is a monstrous thing. Its infinitely long appendages writhe out from a mouth so large, its ends disappear out of view. Together, the pair is pulled in, and the god of the sea breaks from its centuries-old bonds. Inside it now, Guts and Shirka have no choice but to descend deeper. They cut away into its organs, fighting the pressure of the impossibly large being. Its blood rushes through its massive veins, and parasites ten times the size of men crawl in and out of the walls of its flesh. Still, they persist, cutting their way towards the beating of its massive heart. And, after a long fight, they reach it. But it pounds so loud that Guts is almost paralyzed. With each breath, the impossible pressure presses him down, crushing him. But at the last moment, right before he is about to pass out, he hears a song. The heartbeats of the sea god fade away, and he is lifted up by the ancient chant of the returned Marrow. Isma, reunited with her Marrow mother, learns that she too is from the sea, and together, just like it did thousands of years ago, the Marrow's song overpowers the pressure of the sea god once again, and with the newfound strength provided by a millennia of solidarity, Guts hoists Dragon Slayer above his head and cuts its heart in two. Triumphant once again, the crew set sail one last time, and this time, they finally make it to Elfhelm. Elf Island is one of the very few idyllic settings in Berserk, and with the accomplishment of this feat, we finally gain a reprieve from the long road we've traveled. At this point, 11 real-world years have passed since the publication of the Eclipse, and the length of the journey is not diminished in the slightest. But here, everything is bright and new. Shirka and Farnesa get to go to class with other magic users, other children. The elders of the island are kind and wise, and they teach the group a lot about themselves. Isidro plays childhood antics with the others. Puck and Ivalera meet other fairies for the first time in the series. Serpico, Roger, and Guts share a drink under the night sky, and for the first real time, talk about the things that have happened to them. And of course, Casca regains her memories. Flora was right. Danon, the leader of the elves, is a being of immense healing power, and promises to help heal Casca after they arrive. To do so, she sets both Casca and her two closest female friends in a trance, using some beautifully fantastical magic mushrooms. And what we see happen next is... Therapy. Together, Shirka and Farnesa release themselves to their spirit forms and enter Casca's mind. Inside, they see a vast wasteland filled with strange, hostile horrors. Here, too, they see a large three-legged dog pulling a coffin by a chain. The dog, a representation of Guts, is protective over the coffin, but after seeing that the pair are of no harm, lets them open it. Inside, they find a shattered doll that resembles Casca's body. Shortly after, the group is attacked by some massive, phallic-looking creatures, and the pair fights them off. After they encounter, they find a small puzzle piece that fits into the doll. This is obviously a metaphor for their mental exploration. This hellscape, conjured up and visualized by the magic of the Elfhelm flora and fungi, is a manifestation of the powers at play in Casca's collapse, many of which we talked about in part one. The God Hand are here too, and all of them take on viciously phallic forms, alluding to the inciting incident of her mental collapse. Guts, the dog, is a protector, but he is also scary and dangerous. He is a leader, but also a kind of warden, and he is unable to communicate as a person would. This is because Guts too has receded into his masculine elements, 
while Casca, over the long process of their relationship, has pulled him much more center than he was, the armor, represented here by his spiked collar, and the defense mechanisms he has set up, keep him distant and terrifying. He too, is at times, as phallic and dangerous, as the shadows in her mind. I think it's important here too, to talk shortly about the value of psychedelics in psychological therapy. Very shortly, psychedelic drugs including psilocybin, the active ingredient in mushrooms, have actually been used for years in studies about treating depression. It turns out that psychedelics in general, including things like lysergic acid, can actually help people recover from chronic depressive disorders like MDD and GAD. But not because they hold some perfect power or are always beneficial. The fact is that our brains love patterns. When presented with a stimulus, human minds tend to create cyclical lines of thought around them, loops of emotional and irrational rumination. In the case of depression caused by both genetic and exterior influences, the brain accidentally forms a negative emotional loop. It starts to cycle through feelings of uselessness, reliving past traumas, reactivating long, useless responses. These loops alone are incredibly hard to break, and this is where small clinical doses of psychedelics come in. In modern psychological theory, a small dose of a general psychedelic has shown the possibility to break these loops, and while data on this phenomenon is not fully understood, it stands to reason that when we break these detrimental cycles that our brain has created, it gives our psychology a chance to reset to form new loops that might release us from reliving the effects of our past again and again. This is to say that psychedelic drugs are not magical or perfect, but a theory of how they could be used to treat these widely suffered diseases is actually quite well documented, and Miura melds this seamlessly with his mythology. Time does not pass in the astral world like it does in real life, and to Shirka and Farnesa it feels like months. They continue to walk the wasteland inside Casca's imagination, slowly picking up each piece of her they can find, until finally, they find the last one. This one, however, is closed tightly by a figure we have not seen in a long time. The demon child. The child that Guts and Casca had, that was polluted by Griffith, and eventually used to manifest his physical form. Still, they retrieve the last piece, and they are ripped back into reality, back into the light of Elfhelm. And there, Casca is. She's back, after over a decade of struggle. And what a relief it is. She talks like she did way back then. She thanks her caretakers, and finally officially introduces herself to her friends. She smiles, and laughs, and then... It's time for her to meet Guts. But she can't. Even now, even after all of that work and healing, she still can't quite do it. Every time she tries, his form morphs into a horrific image. His armor shrouds his body. The collar of the berserker armor covers his face. His eye and voice disappear, and the phantoms of the god hand flash before her eyes. It's a heartbreaking thing, but it's important to understand why this happens. Like we saw before, Guts has closed himself off in his armor again. Even here, outside of battle, he still wears it while walking around. He hasn't escaped what Casca previously tore him out of. At least, not yet. And until he does, he will be divided from those he loves. Okay. Before we talk about the final chapters of Berserk, let's look at one more thing. A character I haven't really talked about before now is the Skull Knight, the being that snatched Casca and Guts from the grasp of the God Hand at the end of the Eclipse. Throughout the story, the Skull Knight reappears periodically to warn Guts about the consequences of the Eclipse, and to explain what will happen next, except he doesn't really explain it well, does he? His language is strange and vague and Guts repeatedly complains that he doesn't understand what he is trying to say, often leading to dire consequences. But on Elf Island, we learn something about this figure. While vague as well, it becomes apparent 
the Skull Knight has lost a lover too, and it also becomes increasingly clear that he has survived an eclipse, just like Guts and Casca have. His lover, however, did not, and he mourns her passing at the center of the island. The eclipse that caused his suffering is not mentioned at this point, but it's possible it has to do with Void's creation, as this seems to be the member of the God Hand that the Knight has the most adversarial relationship with. He is also the first member that Skull Knight attacks when entering the Eclipse to save Guts, notably with the effect of his blade being turned back upon him. It's at this point, while we watch Skull Knight in the Forest of Stone, that his symbolic purpose starts to become clear. Skull Knight is by far the most armored person in the story. His face, body, even his horse are entirely clad in vicious looking metalwork. Spikes, guards, pauldrons, all separate him interminably from us, and his archaic and unclear language is a result of this division. He too is a powerful being, able to brave enemies that even Guts himself cannot beat, but his defense, his armor, separates him from others. We learn a lot about the symbolism of armor at the end of the Fantasia arc, and this walk with Skull Knight connects the parts of the story that Miura introduced all the way back in the Golden Age, and even before. Near the end of the chapter, Gedfring, a wise elder of Elfhelm, leads them deep into the forest at the center of Elf Island. And here, they meet another blacksmith. The blacksmith that forged the Berserker armor, Hanar. Here, too, lies the idea of succession and legacy. The Skull Knight confesses to being a former wearer of the Berserker armor, and just like in the Iliad, his legacy, his defeats, still exist within its memory. When asked about the Berserker armor, Hennar gongs the chestplate with his forging hammer, and the bloody memories rush forth, showing Guts what it is he has inherited. At times like this, when the things we are passed down seem to be inevitable, seem to be part of the laws of causality, it's important to remember how far we've come. Is Guts' struggle with Griffith over? No. Has he been able to open up again since his trauma? Not really. But when we get sucked into these ideas, these reverberations, we forget one thing in particular. Just look at the difference we've already seen. Sure, Guts is still clad almost perpetually in the Berserker armor, but he is still much more open than Skull Knight. Blood still flows in his veins, and his humanity is far, far from gone. But take it one step further. Serpico, one of Guts' closest friends, wears almost no armor at all. Isidro, the boy who met Guts at such an early age, has developed without anything close to the shields Guts struggles with. He was denied the heavy sword, and instead, under Guts' tutelage, has become a young man with his own style, his own personality, and most importantly, his own childhood, contrasting the horrid dominance Gambino forced upon Guts when he was young. Further still, Isma's nudity bleeds around her, her contagious openness is just as powerful as the isolating aspects of reaction and protection. And this is an emanation of equal power that echoes from Yura's depictions of Casca's care and naked affection for Guts. And finally, look here. This scene shows the band in possibly the happiest place we have ever seen them. It's at this point that Elfhelm has become a home. Casca, Farnesa, Isidro, Isma, they all are happy, open, together. And there's something easy to miss at the side of this scene. Look over here at Isidro, the boy who in the beginning wanted to be indomitable, to be powerful just like the hundred man killer, is naked. Naked in front of women, even, in front of girls his own age. His friendship, and probably most importantly, his close relationship with Isma, has allowed him to be comfortable in a way that his idol, Guts, wasn't. With his friends, he can be open, naked, armorless. And finally, at the end of our legacy sits one more character, the Moonchild, who, with his naked and blemishless body, symbolizes a hope for the future. Here, in the scene of Guts' training, we finally see one of the only scenes where Guts takes off his armor. 
he, of course, has trouble swinging his sword, since he is so used to its support. But more importantly, the Moonchild makes an appearance, sneaking up on Guts. He wordlessly climbs into the empty Berserker armor and stares out at him while he trains. Surprised, Guts asks him if he thinks he's a knight, and then does an incredibly important thing. He takes the armor off of the child, and with one of the first smiles we have seen in a while, he tells the boy to go spend time with Casca, because he knows how strong her influence is. In this scene, Guts knowingly, physically, breaks the legacy of the armor. And with that hope comes the realization that even though Guts and Casca have been burdened with unimaginable obstacles to their happiness, their legacy, their child, does not need to inherit that armor. But of course, our story is not over. Griffith is still clawing his way back to Guts, and with Casca's revival, a link is formed. Because he is linked to the demon child, because of his rape and defilement of Casca and Guts' legacy, Griffith has a connection to the Moonchild too. And the very night we get our first glimpses of progress, it all comes crashing down again. The brands start to bleed, the night becomes silent and eerie, and Guts finds the Moonchild standing silent and alone in a clearing in front of Casca's room. Through the night, before the pain that wakes her, we hear the thoughts that race through Casca's sleeping mind. I remember that sense of nostalgia then. That moonlit beach where I first met him. No, I knew him before that, as Elaine. Affection. Sadness. But from where? I was dreaming on nights of the full moon. I'd become a small child and find myself embraced by nostalgic warmth. But when I wake from the dream, all that remains is a faint sense of loneliness. That, too, soon fades away, along with a single tear, like morning dew. In the beginning, Guts is a demonstrably divided thing. Thirty-four years ago, Mira gave us a challenge. He asked us to rethink to realize that the burdens of the night do have a weight, and that they materialize in our lives as physical things. And, after over three decades, with the final panel he would ever give us, he challenged us again. As Griffith turns towards Guts, luminous and covering Casca with his body, a tear rolls down his eye, and the name of the chapter stands vivid and stark below the panel. Tears like morning dew. And with this panel, possibly the most important panel in all of Berserk, Mira is asking us an impossible question. Just like he wanted us to rethink Guts way back in the beginning, he's asking us to do the same with Griffith. But what? Rethink Griffith. After everything, after all the pain, all of the trauma, everything he has done to ruin Guts and Casca's lives, after all the people he's killed. No, we can't. He has simply done us too much harm. We can't. We can't. But wait. Can you see it? That cowl is creeping over our heads, too. The minute we are challenged with the trauma of the Eclipse, the very second we are forced to reckon with Griffith again, our defense mechanisms leap up. Our armor covers our mind and blinds us from the things we don't wish to see. Guts flails his sword madly, but it doesn't work. Griffith's body phases through the metal. He clutches Casca to him once more, and as soon as he appeared, he vanishes into the air, taking Casca with him. Elfhelm, its protections now shattered, begins to crumble into the sea. The peaceful beasts that live there start to fade into the night air. Its people flock to the party's ship, and Guts collapses on the shore, distraught and destroyed once again. Life is not fair. 
Many times our hard work is not recognized or understood. Our minds, like prisons of themselves, play back things that hurt us again and again. This time, however, we can't fight back, as our brains cycle over and over the things, the people that hurt us morph and grow. They become inhuman phantasms, things that haunt us during long nights, even in places where we feel the safest. The echoes of the birthing ceremony still repeat, and running away will never work. Guts, and by extension us, need to take off the armor. We need to painstakingly and terrifyingly deconstruct these walls we have built. We need to rethink Griffith, not because he deserves it, but because we do. We deserve the ability to let go, to move on, and to do that, we need to not lose ourselves in our armor. Because even though it gives us a resiliency, even though it makes us feel protected from the echoes, the ruminations of what hurt us, it also divides us from the ones we love, the ones that can truly help us. The zeitgeist that surrounds Berserk is massive, and a large portion of it is focused on panels like this, that display a relationship or an affinity for Guts's raw masculine power. There is an undercurrent of respect for the feats Guts can accomplish, for what his sword and armor allow him to do. This is understandable. The raw spectacle of the fantasy is enthralling and powerful. But a respect for domination is not what Berserk is about. That's not what Mira's literature has been slowly telling us through the decades. No, Berserk is so much more. If we cover ourselves in the armor of the beast and flail our dominating power at the things that haunt us, all too often we will find ourselves swiping at immortal gods, just like Guts did when trying to kill Griffith. And while Berserk is made up of some incredibly evocative and beautiful displays of power, Berserk is not about these panels. It's about this one. And this one. And this one. It's about showing us what power we have without the armor, without the sword. It's about a difficult, slow, but triumphant unity. And maybe, if we can see what that looks like in a story, we can find these panels in our lives too, celebrating a friend's wedding, taking care of the ones we love, holding a child's hand. Maybe we can search for them together. This is where Berserk ends for now. But our story will continue. It's easy to be dragged to the beast at moments like these. It feels like it was all for nothing. Casca is gone again. Elfhelm, the one place where we felt safe, is drowned, and our swords lay useless at our sides. But look how far we've come. Casca is back. She is right there in front of us. She can talk and reason and live on. And even though she is currently captured and trapped in a trance, her will still pushes through. Moments of lucidity and effort poke through the facade of powerlessness. And once she makes it back to Guts again, who knows what could happen. The bond Guts and Casca have is such a powerful thing. Griffith would not have taken her away if it were otherwise. And Guts has others as well. And the bonds we have with them are just as strong. Together, we have made so many friends along the way. We have met so many people that can help us recenter, that can gravitate us toward that stable beyond that lies outside of our trauma. Our armor, our defenses have kept us alive during the unendurable, and they have directly led to our survival. But we don't just deserve to survive anymore. We deserve to move on. And to do that, we have to tear our mask away ourselves. Berserk is here to remind us that even at our lowest lows, even when our trauma becomes a deific thing, a god-like beast that manifests itself into our lives as sickness that forces ideas of despair, of self-harm, of suicide, our solidarity remains. It asks us to remember that trust we had in our childhood, and to look forward to the children that will come after us, that there is immense power in the unity between us, our loved ones, and our friends. And that in that unity, together, 
We have killed gods before.